Almighty and most merciful Father, it's by your gift alone that we do that we love you <clears throat> and serve you and our neighbor. Help us to those ends evermore, every day, all the time, through the merits of Jesus, our only Savior. Amen. Verse 5 of Advent Hymn 64. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, ever one. Praise, honor, might, glory be from age to age, eternally. Uh, we turn our attention to the great divine of Cambridge, William Whitaker, in his dispute on Holy Scriptures against the Papists, especially Bill Merman and Stapleton for the publication of the works of the fathers and the early writers of the reformed English church. It gives us the, this is University of Toronto Library. Uh, he was the regent, Whitaker was the Regis Professor of Divinity and Master of St. John's College, Cambridge. Translated by William Fitzgerald, <clears throat> Prebendary of Donamore in the Cathedral of St. Patrick. Uh, printed at Cambridge in 1849. Interesting. Meanwhile, Johnny Newman is beginning to think he's the only guy in church history who did church history. Toronto University. The contents, epistle dedicatory to Lord Burgley. Preface to the Controversies. Question one, the number of canonical books. Question two, the authentic edition and ver versions. Three, the authority of scripture. Four, perspicuity. Five, interpretation of scripture. Six, of the perfection of scripture against unwritten traditions. Go Cranmer's ahead of the game here. To the reader. And then the index. So. 742 pages. Uh, maybe the best book in English on the thing. Epistle dedicatory to the most noble and prudent. William Cecil Knight, Baron Burgley, High Treasurer of England and Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. There have been many heretofore illustrious Cecil who have defended the papal interest and sovereignty with the utmost erudition and keenest zeal. And, and <clears throat> no mean or ver vulgar erudition. But they who've played their part with most address and far outstripped all others of their own side are those men who now, for some years back, have been engaged most earnestly in this cause. A fresh supply of monks, subtle theologians, vehement and formidable controversialists whom that range and in former times unheard of, Society of Jesus, <clears throat> hath brought forth for the calamity of the church and the Christian religion. For when after that black, deadly, baneful, and tedious night of popish superstition and anti-Christianism, the clear and cheerful luster of the gospel had illumined with its rays some portions of the Christian world, tracting and by its incredible charms at the same time moving along to gaze on, admire, and cleave to it, on a sudden, these men sprang up to obscure with pestilential vapors and ravish, if possible, from our view, this light is so hateful to themselves, so hostile and prejudicial to their interests. So indeed had John, that holy disciple of Christ, predicted in the apocalypse that a star which had fallen from heaven and received the key of the infernal pit should remove the covering of the abyss and cause a mighty smoke to issue forth like the smoke of a great furnace shedding darkness over the sun and heaven. This pit from the time that it was first opened hath not sealed to exhale perpetual smoke to blind the eyes of men. And as the same prophet hath foretold, hath sent forth innumerable locusts upon the earth like scorpions. <coughs> who've wounded with their deadly stings all men upon whose foreheads the seal of God was not impressed. The event itself, the best interpreter of prophecies, has illustrated the obscurity of the prediction. 
or who can doubt the meaning of the star, the pit, the smoke, the locusts, who considers the state of papal power in which they are all so portrayed to very life as to be most readily discerned by anyone who can compare together past and present and interprets what was foretold about to happen by those amongst whom it has occurred. Amongst these locusts, <clears throat> that is, as very learned men justly deem, amongst the innumerable troops of monks, none, as we said before, have ever appeared more keen or better prepared and equipped for doing mischief than are the Jesuits at this present day, who in a short space have surpassed all other societies in what kind in numbers, in credit, and in audacity. Other monks, following the rule and practice of former times, lived in general a life of leisure and inactivity, and spent their time not in reading and the study of the sciences, but in repeating by the glass certain offices for the canonical hours, which contributed nothing to either the advancement of learning or religion. But the Jesuits have pursued a far different course. They have laid, left the shade of ancient sloth and inactivity in which the other monks have grown gray and have come forth to engage in toils, to treat of arts and sciences, to undertake and through earnest struggle for the safety of the common interests. It has come to be understood that the cause of Rome, which shaken by the perilous blows dealt on every side by men of ability and learning had begun in many parts to totter and give way, could never be defended or maintained except by learned and diligent and active champions. For just as a dilapidated mansion, <clears throat> unless propped up almost every day by fresh and firm buttresses, will suddenly fall in a vile and tough total ruin. So they perceived that the Roman synagogue, tottering as it was and threatening to fall, in its wretched state of decay and dilapidations, had need continually of new supports and bracings to maintain any remnant of its state and dignity under the pressure of such assaults. Yet with all their efforts shall they never be able to avert the imminent calamity or rescue themselves from perdition. But as buildings whose foundations are subverted, their walls pierced, their roofs uncovered, having no part secure, can never be supported long by a multitude of artificial props, so that the church of theirs, all rent and torn on every side, in which <clears throat> nor roof nor pillar nor foundation remains sound, intrinsically devoid of firmness and integrity, must at long at length fall headlong and crush many to destruction in its ruins. We are not to believe that the Roman church is flourishing because the Jesuits are often able to impose upon inconstant and unskillful persons and lead them into popish fraud by lure and blandishment of their fallacious reasoning. They'd be writing about the limos. Let the Jesuits do their best. Let them exert, if possible, still more intense sedulity and omit nothing that learning and diligence can accomplish without the aid of truth. <clears throat> Yet all they can accomplish will be this, to prop a falling house with mounds and buttresses, to afford some brief refreshment to Antichrist, now gasping in his long last agony, and despite all the rules of physic, apply remedies to a desperate disease. Among these Jesuits, Robert Bellarmine, a native of Italy, has now for several years obtained a great and celebrated name. At first he taught scholastic divinity in Belgium, but afterwards, having removed to Rome, he treated of theological controversies in such a manner as to excite the admiration and gain the applause of all. His lectures were eagerly listened to by his auditors, transcribed, transmitted into every quarter, and treasured up as jewels and amulets. After some time for the sake of rendering them more generally useful, they were epitomized by certain Englishmen. 
finally, the first volume of these controversies hath been published at Ingolstadt, printed by Sartorius, and the rest are expected in due time. Now, therefore, Bellarmine is cried up by his party as an invincible champion, as one with whom none of our men would dare to engage, whom nobody can answer, and whom, if anyone should hope to conquer, they would regard him as an utter madman. When you, honored sir, demanded my opinion of this writer, I answered, as indeed I thought, that I deemed him to be a man unquestionably learned, possessed of a happy genius, a penetrating judgment, multifarious rating, one moreover who is wont to deal more plainly and honestly than is the custom of other papists, to press his arguments more home and to stick more closely to the question. Thus, indeed, it became a man who had been trained in the schools and who had made the handling of controversies his professed business to dismiss all circumlocutions and digressions and concern himself entirely with the argument. And having read all that had been previously written upon the subject, to select those reasons and replies which seemed to have had the most strength and sinew in them, in the prosecution of the task, he was led the way everything with a profound and anxious solicitude and has sometimes differed from his predecessors and struck out new explanations of his own, perceiving, I suppose, that the old ones were not sound enough to be relied on. We have in one instance in his treatment of 1 Corinthians 14, where the apostle forbids the use of strange language in the church, the former paper, Popish writers usually understood that place to speak of exhortations or sermons. Uh, it's got a footnote. The first complete edition of Bellarmine's Controversies was printed in Engelshot, three tomes, 1586. The oldest edition, which I've seen, is at 1588. You know, <clears throat> okay, it's just a history of the publications or if they conceded that it might be understood of divine service, interpreted it so as to require that the words of the minister should be, on, should be understood, not the whole congregation, but only by him who made the responses in their name. But Balaraman, having reflected upon the falsehood and weakness of these evasions, hath invented another for himself, and pretends that the apostle is speaking not of the offices of divine service, nor of yet public reading of scriptures, but only of certain songs and canticles. What, however, or what sorts of things these were, or why they required to be recited in a known language more than the common prayers or scripture lessons is not easy to understand. But of this place of the apostle, and this now pretense of Palermans, We've discoursed sufficiently at large in the second question, chapter 18 of this controversy. <clears throat> so again, where he is answering on objection and drawn from St. Peter's calling the prophetic word a lamp, he does not answer, as Hosius did, that in the prophecies there are many things plain and that what is enigmatically spoken in the prophets is expressed clearly in the gospel. But he says that prophecy is called a lamp, not because it is easily understood, but because it illuminates what is what is understood. He saw clearly that Hosius's exposition left our doctrine of the perspicuity of scripture in sufficient strength, and therefore excogitated this new one upon which we have treated in question four, chapter four. In the same way, when we maintain that the mysteries of the faith should be concealed from no one and allege in proof these words of Christ, what ye hear in the ear that proclaim ye upon <clears throat> the housetops, Bellarmine has recourse to a strange and hitherto, I think, unheard of interpretation. That is, if ye need so require. Again, when we urge that the scriptures is called canonical, and therefore is what the very appellation indicates, the rule of faith and of living. Alarman answers confidently in the same chapter that the scripture was not published to be the rule of our faith, but to serve as a sort of combinatory, useful to preserve and cherish the faith received by preaching, close quote. 
So that according to the new interpretation of Bilarmans, we learn that the scriptures are no rule of faith at all, but a certain combinatory, an honor which they share with many others, nor yet even a necessary one, but only useful to the end of preserving the traditions. This guy's good. This is a noble judgment of the value of scripture and altogether worthy of a Jesuit, a judgment which leaves the Bible only the office of admonishing us as if we required to be admonished and not taught. Blarman hath innumerable such new discoveries with which he defends the papal cause in a different manner, indeed from that of its former patrons, but yet is so far from really serving it that he hath really done it the greater damage and injury within this, with discreet and attentive readers. For hence it appears that while Balarman cannot approve the answers of others, it is impossible to invent new ones which are not worse than the old. I remember too that in the course of the same conversation between us, I allowed Balarman the merit of dealing less dishonestly with the testimonies of the fathers than is customary with others and of not captiously or maliciously perverting the state of the question, a fault which I found had particularly disgusted you in certain writers, whereas religious disputes and controversies should be managed in such a way as to eschew all craft and seek truth and truth alone with a holy earnestness. I acknowledge that while our adversaries are gross, grossly in this respect, our own party stood not so wholly clear of the same fault as because the investigators of truth so sacred, which in proportion as they have heavenly are more heavenly in their nature, should be searched and handled with the most sincerity. But since many, more eager for contention than for truth, propose to themselves scarcely any, any other object than to be able to say something against their opponents, and it would be esteemed the champions of a cause which they love better than they understand. So it comes to pass that the just state of the question is laid aside with a cold neglect, and truth as usual is lost in altercation. Thus Balarman himself, for he understands to impugn our doctrine of the perspicuity of scriptures, lays this down as the state of the question whether scripture can be so plain in itself as to be sufficient without any explication to determine controversies of faith. And he imposes on us the office of maintaining that the scriptures are in themselves most plain and easy and stand in need of no interpretation. As if we either thought that every part of scripture was plain, easy, and clear, or ever rejected the exposition and interpretation of scriptures. Could Bellarmine really hope to impose upon us in so gross a manner as to make us confess that to our opinion, which had never so much as entered our thoughts? But to this question, we've given a sufficiently plain answer in the fourth question. I could wish... <coughs> uh, I could wish that this were the only place in which Bellarmin had shown bad faith and that he had not elsewhere also played the Jesuit in matters of no small importance. For there can be no end of writing and disputing, no decision of controversies, no concord among Christians until laying aside all party feelings and assuming the most impartial desire and design of investigating the truth. We apply ourselves entirely to that point where the stress of the controversy lies. And now, since I am dressing one who is accustomed both to think of these matters often and seriously himself and to listen to others delivering their opinions upon them, allow me briefly to explain and commend to your consideration a thing which I have long wished for and which I trust might come be accomplished with singular advantage and with no great difficulty. Our adversaries have oft, very often demanded a disputation and declared that they especially wish and long for permission to hold a scholastical contest with us upon the subject of those questions which form the matter of our present inquiries. 
whether this demand be made hypocritically, as many suppose, or sincerely, I, for my part, would desire that they may have their asking. For although they cannot deny that they have often been disputed with within Germany, France, and England, nay, that those learned men, Melanchthon and Brentius, repaired to Trent for the sole purpose of defending the confessions of their churches against the popish theologians, yet I would have made them to understand that they have no reason for believing that their cause hath become one whit the better, since it hath been espoused by its Jesuit patrons than heretofore when defended by ancient orders. Let the Jesuits be allowed acute, ready, practiced, eloquent, and full of resources. Let them be in a word whatever they are or are believed to be. Yet truth is ever one and the same. Still, the more it is attacked, it shines out with greater brilliance and luster. Perhaps, indeed, it will be said that none can be found who would dare to stand a conflict with the Jesuits or are more fit to be matched with such opponents. I know well, for my part, how confident and boastful these men are and what a look and mien they assume in disputation as if they'd only learned how most arrogantly to despise their adversaries, not how to give a better answer to their arguments. Yet since the sacred laws of such <clears throat> conferences secure to each man just so much advantage, and no more as he can win by argument and reason, and whatever it must be said reduced to the rules of syllogism, there remains no ground to fear <clears throat> that painted falsehood will prevail more than simple and naked truth. Not to speak of foreign nations and churches where everyone knows that there is an abundance of learned men. This island itself possesses persons well skilled in every kind of learning who could readily not only explain the truth, but defend it also against adversaries. In both our universities, there are men so practiced and skilled in every portion of these controversies that they would rather forfeit their recognizance than shrink from the dispute so honorable, just, and necessary. <clears throat> Nor do I see any great inconvenience to be apprehended from this course, as some suspect, for all those who are bound to, to this cause by a blind superstition will probably be so far from reaping any advantage that they will rather be rendered still more obstinate and some fickle people will, perhaps, be alienated from our side. As in every disputation, opinions incline different ways, according as the several auditors are capable of judging or inclined to attend and reflect. Yet we may reasonably augur the following important results. First, it would easily appear, what is the true state of the question in each controversy, which should be pressed, driven home, and discussed, without regard to impertinent and trifling altercations. In the next place, it cannot be doubted that all who measure religion, not by the decrees of men or their own caprice, but by the standard of holy scriptures, and were ready to acknowledge and embrace the truth when it is found, would easily reject the rotten devices of the papists and prefer that sound and wholesome doctrine of the faith which our churches have drawn from the pure springs of scripture to their old and idle superstition. Lastly, the wishes of our adversaries would be satisfied, nor could they any longer with any show of probability reproach us openly with cowardice. Yea, the truth itself, which we profess, would rise above the suspicion which it has incurred in the minds of some and establish itself in the light and conscience of the world. There is nothing which truth fears so much as to be prevented from appearing in public and being exposed to the examination of men. It would rather have any patron that is not absolutely dumb than go without defense from the unrighteous calumnies of unjust accusers. One thing only I would have carefully provided prudent and grave moderators should preside in this disputation, 
who should restrain petulance, repress clamors, permit no breach of decorum, and maintain order, modesty, and discipline. The determination rests with those who are at the helm of church and state, with yourself especially in regard to that singular wisdom which hath ever distinguished you in every judgment and deliberation. I now return to Bellarmin. I am rejoiced that these controversies of his, so much celebrated in common report, have now been published by himself, so that we may all easily judge of their quality, their value, their strength, and their importance, nor believe Bellarmin to be any other than we find him by their evidence. And although our adversaries' opinions might be collected from the many, other writers who have appeared in great numbers on the same side, <clears throat> yet there, since there are many points upon which they do not all agree, it hath been a matter of some obscurity hitherto to ascertain the real judgment of the Roman Church. But now that Bellarmin hath been published, we shall know better and more certainly what it is they hold upon every subject, the arguments on which they especially rely, what is, so to speak, the very marrow of popery, which is thought to be as much in the Jesuits as in the Pope himself. Knowing, therefore, how much our party desire that these Jesuits should be answered, and having fallen in with a manuscript copy of Barlarman's lectures, I thought it worth my while to handle these same controversies in the schools in the discharge of the duties of my office to discuss the new sophisms of Jesuits and vindicate our unadulterated truth from the captious cavils with which the popish professor has entangled it. <clears throat> Afterwards, being often requested by many persons to publish some of my disputations against our adversaries and let the whole church share in the benefit of my toil and studies, I determined to commit to the press this controversy concerning scripture, which is the first of them, and which forming as it does, a sort of vestibule to the rest, and the sufficing of itself to fill a reasonable volume, seemed as it were to man that I should not wait until I had completed the remainder, but publish it by itself and separate from the other readers, others. In all this, I did nothing without the approbation of the most reverend father, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a man of the greatest wisdom and the greatest learning, who having read and thoroughly considered the whole controversy, declared it worthy of publication. Now that it is published, I dedicate it to you, most noble Cecil, whom I have ever esteemed the great patron and the Mycenaeus of my studies, you in whom this college prides herself as a number of our body and will always, as long as she stands, challenge to herself on this account a just prerogative. You whom our university respects as chancellor, whom the whole state celebrates as a father of your country, whom the church recognizes as a son serviceable both to its interest and safety. I pray God he may preserve you ever in safety and prosperity to our church, state, university, and college. Your most devoted servant, William Whittaker, from the College of St. John, Evangelist, April 30, 1588. Well, that's, we'll have to end it there. We read his preface or his epistle dedicatory to uh, Sir William Cecil. Um, and now, which we'll pick up next time, the preface to the controversies delivered to the audience at Cambridge. Verse 1 of Advent Hymn 65. Prepare the way, O Zion, your Christ is drawn near. Let every hill and valley a level way appear. Greet one who comes in glory foretold in sacred story. O oh, blessed is Christ that came in, God's most holy name. <clears throat>